Everyone's happy with the quizzes? Most people passed? Fine. So I must make them harder, the quizzes. Maybe shorter time, five minutes instead of ten minutes. <clears throat> On Monday we, we talked about several things about the TCP IP protocol architecture including addresses. Uh, we saw an example of web browsing where in web browsing using HTTP the, the sim simple description of what happens is that your browser sends a request for a web page to the web server. The web server sends back that web page in a response as well as some other information saying everything was okay. And then your browser displays that HTML on your screen. And we, what did we do? We saw, so I accessed a real website and I used some special software on my computer to record all the packets or all the messages sent and received by my computer. This software called Wireshark allows us to then look at those messages sent and received. We'll see that, I'll use that as demo software through the course and maybe in the assignment you'll get to use it uh, yourself. There's a lot of information here that you will not understand yet but over time we'll, we'll learn that. What we want to move to is look at some of the performance aspects of computer networks. When we send a message, we use, mold from my computer's perspective, it uses multiple protocols. And we saw with web browsing, and we can see it in here, is that we have some data that we want to send. In this selected packet, it's actually the response from the web server. This orange one. The web server is sending my computer, the laptop, the web page. From server to laptop. So the data that's coming from the web server to the laptop is the web page. So that's what we want to get from one computer to another. Remember, data communications, getting data from one location to another. The data <coughs> is the web page. How big is the web page? Well, in fact, we can see that here. We, we could expand. Uh, you could count the characters and count how many bytes that represents. In fact, this software gives us a summary down here. This HTML web page contains 105 bytes. It may be hard to see, but there's 105 bytes in the web page. So the amount of data that we want to get from server to laptop is 105 bytes. But sent across the network, and into my laptop, we'll see that there's much more than that was actually sent. Well, what was actually sent into my laptop, one protocol used was HTTP. And we'll see with many protocols, what they do is they take the data that we want to deliver and they attach some extra information to that data. And we call that extra information commonly a header. Some extra information to support the operation of the protocol. In the case of HTTP, that extra information, if I expand, is, is listed here. And many of it, many of the things uh, may not make sense, but the server sends me the data, the web page, as well as the date and time at the server, some identifier of the server software, and many other pieces of information that may be useful for the protocol to operate correctly. So not just, is, not just data is sent from server to laptop, but other information as well that supports the protocol. Uh, for example, in HTTP it sends the type of content. In this case it's HTML. If it was a JPEG, this value would be different, saying that the content in this message is a particular type. All this information is defined as part of the protocol, as part of HTTP. We do not send that HTTP message directly across the link 
and across the network. In fact, we use another protocol to deliver it, TCP. So TCP takes the information from HTTP and then puts it inside its own message and also adds extra information. And we will not go through all of them, but we'll see again if we expand, we see TCP attaches more information. Num sequence numbers, port numbers, checksums. TCP sends all of that to the internet protocol, IP, which then attaches more information. Again, many different things, including, and common in protocols, the source address, the IP address of the computer that sent it, and the destination address, who we're sending to. This information is included inside the message that's sent across the internet. It's included as part of the, the IP header. And Ethernet does the same. So most protocols attach extra information so that they will operate correctly. A way to visualize that is, if we go back to our slides, on this one. This is this, this example of web browsing. Uh, this is the example of the request. It could also be the response. The data that we want to get from one point to another, let's say the data here, or the user data, the data that the user is interested in, is in fact what we say encapsulated inside another message. The application layer protocol, HTTP, attaches extra information. We call it the HTTP header. So we have the original data plus a HTTP header. So this all happens inside the sending computer. That HTTP message is then delivered to TCP, which attaches some extra information for TCP to work. We we'll call it the TCP header. We're not too concerned at this stage of what's the, this extra information. There's many different things that can be attached. The point is that we include this header information and we'll see that it impacts on performance. IP attaches a header. So in fact we have the original data, the HTTP header, TCP header, IP header. And Ethernet, the data link layer protocol, attaches a header. And the physical layer, although it's not shown very well here, the physical layer, you think, just takes a sequence of bits. All this information is just uh, binary values. The data, the headers. I skipped one. The header means we attach it at the front of the message. We sometimes can attach something at the end, and we call it a trailer. So Ethernet may attach a trailer, some information at the end. Treat that as a sequence of bits. The role of the physical layer down the bottom is to convert those bits into some signal to transmit across the link. So this is just my picture of some signal, some electrical signal, for example. And that's sent across the link. The receiver processes that and maybe sends it across the next link and so on until it reaches the destination. So in fact, to get this user data from one point to another, we don't just send that uh, 105 bytes web page, we send that user data plus all these header information and trailers in some cases. The one consequence of the way that protocols work like this is that all this header information we can think of as overhead. It's informational, it's bits that are sent across our network or link that are not the real data, but some extra information for the protocols to work, and they reduce the performance of our network, or lower the efficiency of our network, as we'll see in some calculations. Uh, let's put some numbers to that in our example. How big are these headers? Let's go through a simple example, the one we captured last week. A 
before we go to the numbers. So one way to, to visualize the information sent across the network is these types of diagrams that show them the entire message. And that message contains some headers from different protocols, some trailers sometimes, and the original data, the user data. And we'll try and draw a picture like that. And they have particular sizes, and that may impact on performance. And I'll record on the board these numbers. In our case, when we're sending the web page from server to the laptop, the user data, I'll just write the data, in our case is 105 bytes. Uh, so the amount of, say, the user data, that is the information that we want to get from one computer to another is 105 bytes, uppercase B. Our goal is to get that 105 bytes to the laptop. But what do we actually send across the network? Well, there's that data. There's a HTTP header attached to that. How big is the HTTP header? If we select here, it shows us down the bottom here, it's 436 bytes. If you cannot see this, 436 bytes means all the information inside here, which includes this 200 OK message, the date, the server, all these other fields of information, totals 200, uh, 436 bytes. So I'll just record the numbers here. I won't write B for bytes here, everything, all the units are bytes. But in fact, we also attach the TCP header. And it's 32 bytes. This is not to scale. And if we count the IP header, it's another 20 bytes of information. And the Ethernet header, the last one we have captured, is 14 bytes. So what I've just drawn on the board is, at least from my computer's perspective, the, the entire message received. It contains the, the original data, the web page, but it also contains other information. Ethernet, 14 bytes. And in fact, Wireshark shows us the total size, 599 bytes. About 600 bytes. Does it add up? Check. Anyone have a calculator? Mobile phone? A laptop? It says the user data is 105 bytes. The web page that we're transferring, that's the real thing that we want to transfer, is 105 bytes long. Doesn't, doesn't quite add up, does it? There, there's some special thing that happened here. The web page is 105 bytes. But in fact, before the web server sent it, it actually compressed the, the, the page. It took that 105 byte web page and compressed it down to 97 bytes. Okay, that doesn't always happen, it did happen in this case. That is, this data is 97 bytes. If you add up these numbers, you should get 599, I hope so. Maybe there's something missing, is there? No, 13, 15, 19, yeah, ends up in a 9. Okay. 
So the message that is sent and received by my computer, my laptop, contains 599 bytes. It contains all this header information and some data. But in fact, the original data was 105 bytes. Some compression was applied to reduce that 105-byte HTML fi file down to 97 bytes. It's a special case that happened in this web page transfer. How efficient is this web page transfer, transfer from, the web, from the user's perspective? If we look at just this one message, how efficient are we in transferring the user data? Well, how, let's put a number to it. Can we measure the efficiency of this, the delivering of the user data to my laptop? The goal here is to get the, the web page to my laptop, and then my browser can display it. That's From the user's perspective, that's what I want, to get that web page. But the protocols in operation include some extra information for them to work correctly. In total, there was 599 bytes delivered across the network or to my laptop. But from the user's perspective, only 105 bytes were real data or useful data. The rest was what we may call overhead. That gives us a measure of efficiency in at least this simple, this single packet. Uh, 105 bytes of real data divided by 599 bytes of total data is about 17% or 0 0.17 if you do this calculation or as a percentage about 17%. That is, of the total amount of information sent, only 17% represents the web page. So we'd say that for this single packet, we're about 17% efficient in using the network to deliver that user data. So we can start to analyze the performance of our network by considering, in just a simple case, considering the amount of user data delivered relative to the amount of total data sent through the network. We want the efficiency to be as high as possible. What if my uh, user data was not 105 bytes, but the web page was bigger? What if the web page was increased to, say, 1,000 bytes? Or about 1,000 bytes? Well, we increase the size by about 900 bytes. I'll say about. Let's, let's do it quickly, the mathematics. So if the web page was 900 bytes larger, then the total message size would be 900 bytes larger because the headers would be still the same size or very close to them. They do not change. So if this is increased by 900 bytes, then this is increased by about 900 bytes. We've got about 600 plus 900 is 1,500 bytes. So if the web page was 1,000 bytes, then the total message size would be about 1,500 bytes. 1,000 divided by 1,500 is what? Two thirds. 66% efficient. There's some approximations there, but it's close. Which would be better? Better use of our network and of our link because we're spending more percentage of the time sending real data as opposed to sending headers. Increasing the size of the user data, if the headers are fixed, increasing the size of the user data increases the efficiency of the use of the network, which is important. If you have a small amount of user data, you still need to add the headers 
and it becomes less efficient than having a large amount of user time. What else can we say here? Any questions on on this? Yep. I found the header a freaking size. Okay. Are, are the size of the headers fixed? I'll say roughly yes. Okay. The size of the header actually depends upon the, the protocol. So TCP, if you look at the standard, defines the structure of the header and what information can be included. It may vary a little bit in some cases. But this is a, a typical size in the order of tens, 20, 30 bytes for TCP. And usually if one packet is 32 bytes, the next one will probably be the same. It may vary a little bit. IP is usually by default 20 bytes. HTTP can go up and down. It may be hundreds of bytes. So yes, it may vary a little bit, but normally over a short period of time they're fixed. The data may vary a lot. You download a small web page, you download a large web page. So the data can vary from tens of bytes, 100 bytes, up to 1,000 bytes and larger. So the data varies much more than the header size. Usually Ethernet is also fixed there. It's different protocols have different header sizes, as we see here, all different. Uh, and the exact values are, we're not too concerned about here. It's just the point that for every protocol we normally add some extra information and that incurs some overhead. And that reduces the efficiency of our data transfer. Because to deliver the real data, we actually need to transmit more. Any other questions? We'll, we'll continue on some different performance calculations. But let's see if we can get this point clear. Okay. Easy. Not, not, not easy. Why is it not easy? The calculation. Uh, we've done two things so far. We look at a message that's sent and I've captured the message, I've recorded the message, the exact piece of information received by my computer, that one message. And I can see that the amount of, the size of the web page was 105 bytes. That was the size of the web page contained in that message. But there was other information in that message as well, what we call the headers for each protocol. And I can check the size of them. Total message size, if I add them up, was, and it shows in the software, about 600 bytes. Web page size, about 100 bytes or 105 bytes. So what percentage of the total message is the web page? Well, 17%. 105 divided by 599 expressed as a percentage. That's, in other words, the efficiency of that web page delivery in that one message. If we increase the user data, but keep the other things fixed, for example, increase this up to 1,000, the headers and an extra 500, then it's 1,000 divided by 1,500, which is about 66.6%. Well, so real data or user data divided by the total size in this case. We'll see some more calculations over this topic and, and some future ones. Uh, there was one slide I think we, which is related that we skipped over one or two lectures ago. This just uh, describes some of the, the notation or the terminology that we've started to introduce. It's common for many protocols, not all, but most protocols, we have some data to carry but we have some extra information and that's carried usually in a header. Sometimes it's called a trailer because it's added to the end. The header's added to the start of the data, trailer to the end. And the, this process of adding the header or including the data in a larger message is called encapsulation. 
What's inside the header? Many different things. Maybe source and destination addresses, it may be sequence numbers, some parity check, many different things. Ignore the second point about a pro protocol data unit, we won't use that terminology. Segmentation we will cover later when necessary, again. The main point is that we have our message that contains the header and the data. I've said a, a message, sometimes I also say a packet, again some terminology. Generally, the messages we send across a network or a link we can refer to as a message or maybe more commonly a packet, a packet of information. So I think a packet contains header plus data. But we'll see other terminology as well. Sometimes they're called messages, segments, datagrams, frames. It's just in different technologies and different fields we use different names. The general name or the more common one is a packet. One packet, but we'll see some others come up uh, along, along the way in this course. This leads us into this issue of, well, how do we measure the performance of networks and of links? How do we measure the performance of communication systems? Well, there was one example. Look at the efficiency of the data transfer. We'll look at some very basic performance measures for different internet applications and give a few more examples. First, applications. What's an internet application or a networked application? Well, let's distinguish between, say, a standalone application and a network or a distributed application. A standalone application like you install Microsoft Office on your computer. To, to use Microsoft Office, you don't need a network connection. You can create documents on your own computer. You don't need to talk to some server or some other computers to use that application in most cases. We'd call that a standalone application. It just runs on a single computer to perform its purpose. It has some user interface, some, some GUI that you can click on and, and, and do things on, and some application logic, that is the, the code behind it that does all the processing. So we have standalone applications. They just run on a single computer. But some applications, we we'll call them network or generally distributed applications, to work they must communicate with other instances of that application on other computers. Web browsing. For web browsing to work, if I just install Firefox on my computer and have no internet connection, it's not of much use to me. Okay. So your web browser would say is a network application in that for web browsing to work, we need to communicate from my Firefox application to some web server. So Firefox has some user interface, of course, some application logic, that is, to do the processing and to save files and so on. But it also has some communication mechanisms, some features that allow it to send a message to the server and receive a response back. So we distinguish between standalone applications and network applications, or internet applications in general. We're going to focus on the communication mechanisms. Well, some examples, and I think you know a lot of these. You use a lot. Some internet-based applications, file transfer, email, web browsing, remote login. You connect into another computer and perform some operations. Database, and many other applications. Instant messaging. Well, in fact, that may come later. Other internet applications that we can categorize differently are multimedia or real-time applications. Still we use across the internet, but they have different requirements in terms of performance. Things like audio and video streaming, you're watching YouTube, or maybe more, uh, more precisely, your, uh, or a more accurate representation, you're streaming some radio to your computer, you're in a voice or video chat with someone, 
using Skype, talking to someone across the internet, video or voice call. Gaming applications where you're playing a game and it's sending data to a server and that's going to many other users at the same time, so you interact with other users. Collaborating, sharing your desktop with other users. We'll distinguish between these multimedia, multimedia or real-time applications and the ordinary or traditional internet applications, like just web browsing and email. What's the difference? Well, the main difference is about performance or what they require for performance. These traditional applications are about transferring data from one location to another. The data is an email, a file, a web page. It's important that that data that we receive is accurate. The file at the server and the file I receive should be exactly the same. So accuracy is the most important feature there. With real-time and multimedia applications, sometimes accuracy is not so important, but more important is the timeliness. Anyone play online gaming? What's a measure of online gaming that you may know? You check whether the server is ping, the ping time. That is, ping in online gaming, you connect to a server and you want to know the delay between sending a message from your computer to the server. Sometimes it's called the ping, a, a ping or the ping time. It's in the order of milliseconds. Ping is, we'll see, is an application for uh, doing exactly that, checking the delay between one computer and, an, and another, the round trip time. I don't think it stands for anything. Maybe it's a backronym. It, it, they've made it stand for something. You ping something. You check, check whether it exists. Uh, what's a good ping time? Anyone play games? For a game? Yeah? Anyone else? Anyone know? A ping time, a good ping time. If you're playing a game, if the delay between you and the server is 10 seconds, is that good? No. In the order of milliseconds. Milliseconds, tens of milliseconds. So for that application to work well, timeliness is important. That is, getting message to the other uh, computer in a short amount of time. Similar when you're on a voice call with Skype or a similar application, if there's a large delay between you and the other person, it's very hard to have a conversation in the order of hundreds of milliseconds. So we have different requirements in terms of performance. It's more complex than that, but roughly. Some applications, accuracy is the most important. With multimedia and real-time, timeliness is more important. last thing for this topic is we want to look at three or four different ways to measure performance. Common ways. There are many ways to measure performance, but we'll look at three or four common ways. To measure the performance, we say the performance metrics, the things that we use to measure performance. Uh, just Well, there's five listed here. We'll go through, I think, three in detail. Bandwidth, data rate, throughput, delay, and packet delay variation. We're going to spend some time on data rate, throughput, and delay. The others will uh, either not touch or cover later. First, bandwidth. In many communication systems, we at the physical layer, we send signals. Okay, So we take our bits and transmit it as some signal some electrical signal along a, a cable, some radio signal through the air. And those signals ca uh, have some frequency or range of frequencies. So the frequency of a sine wave, for example. And the range of frequencies that we use, we'll see, is a very important measure of the performance of a communication system. The range or the set of frequencies that uh, we can send in a particular communication system we call the bandwidth. And we'll see that the measure is in hertz. So the bandwidth used in uh, AM radio, when you listen to an AM radio channel on your car, in your car, 
then the bandwidth for that signal, for sending the audio from the radio channel to your car, is about 10 kilohertz, 10,000 hertz. Different systems use different bandwidth signals. And we'll see that the larger the bandwidth, the better the performance in these other metrics, but we'll see the larger the cost. We're not going to cover that in this topic because in the next topic when we go into what are, what are these signals, we'll go in and define this in much more detail. But we'll come back to bandwidth in the next topic. The next two or three we'll spend a bit of time now on because they're important and you know about them already. We often, with computers, we care about getting bits from one location to another, a file, some audio, but represented as bits. The speed at which we can get those bits from one side to another is called the data rate. The number of bits a communications channel or a network can transmit in some period of time. The units being bits per second. What's a channel? Think of that as the transmission system or transmission line or, or part of it. So I connect my blue laptop to my grey laptop via a cable. I'm one thing I'm interested in in terms of the performance is how many bits I can get per second from one laptop to another. And that's the data rate, the rate at which the data can be sent across that transmission system or channel. Let's look at that with a few examples. I'm going to plug my cable in here. set up my second laptop and we'll see if we can communicate between the two in a moment. Turn off my wireless, I don't need that. So I've connected my two laptops directly via a cable. I'm not going to use Wi-Fi or anything, I've just connected via a single LAN cable, so I'm using the wired LAN, the blue LAN cable. How fast can I send data from one to the other? Any guesses? Have a guess. One's two years old, one's five years old, or four years old. 100 megabits per second. Let's have a look. So we care about how fast it, we can deliver the data between two computers, the data rate. Well, I can actually check on here. I plug the cables in. We're using uh, what's called generally called Ethernet, a wired LAN technology. And the speed at which I can send and receive depends upon my LAN cards. It depends upon the capabilities of my laptops. In fact, this blue one is a bit older than this one and much cheaper. Uh, I've got a program that will tell me the speed or the data rate of my Ethernet interface. Actually, first, from yesterday, ifconfig tells me the IP address. I don't have one at the moment. It's disconnected. It's connected now. Let's try again. Nothing works. We'll try. Now we're right. Sorry. Okay, my Ethernet wired LAN interface has an IP address 192.168.3.2. And I've set this blue one to be 192.168.3.1. So they're connected, they both have IP addresses, so they should be able to communicate. 
How fast can they communicate? I've got another program, ETH Tool. ETH Tool tells me some information about my ETH, my Ethernet interface. I need a password to check this. Uh, there's a lot of information here, but I'll just focus on the one thing we care about, speed. 100 megabits per second. That is, my LAN cards on both computers have negotiated. When I plugged in the cable, they did some negotiation, and they checked which speed both support, and they come up with 100 megabits per second. My grey laptop actually supports 1,000 megabits per second, but my blue one does not. It's a bit older. So they use the lowest common or the highest common speed that they both support. So that's the data rate from our my leak. 100 megabits per second, 100 million bits per second to be sent. Let's send some data across that link and measure how fast the data is delivered. So the data rate, let's make note, is 100 megabits per second. Let's do a, a speed test and, and check the speed. My blue laptop actually has a, has a web server, and I have some files on it that I can download from the web server. So I'm going to use my gray laptop to download a file and also measure how the speed of that download. Instead of using a web browser, because I don't care what the file is, I just want to measure and time how, how long it takes to measure, download a particular file, I'll use some command line program to do it. Where I type in the URL, and I recall from the web server the file name. I've set this up before, let's explain. On the blue laptop, I have a 50 megabyte file. I've taught, just called it meg50.bin. It's just a binary file, 50 megabytes in length on the blue laptop. I'm going to use a program wget to download that file using HTTP. So this is the IP address of the blue laptop. This is the directory, the file name. So when I press enter, my gray laptop is going to download this file. And it's also going to report how long it takes. Assume everything's set up. Downloading, 100% done, average speed, 11.2 megabytes per second. All right. That was the speed measured in the file transfer, in this case. Data rate 100 megabits per second. Here, note the uppercase B, bytes, megabytes per second. Let's convert. I, bad habit of drawing the dots there. Megabits per second. Multiply by 8 to get megabits per second. My link supports 100 megabits per second, but when I downloaded that file, in that specific case, the speed I delivered the data was 89.6 megabits per second. Why? Why is it less than 100? Because of these overheads. A, because of the packet, the file of 50 megabytes when we send the packets across the network, there's some extra headers added. In fact, it's split into multiple packets, and each packet has extra headers. In fact, if we captured with Wireshark, we would see that. But this just shows us, well, 
for that 50 megabytes to be transferred, if you include all the headers, and there are even some other overheads, the average speed you get is 89.6 megabits per second. How efficient is my data transfer? What's the efficiency in this case? The maximum speed my link supports is 100 million bits per second, but when I performed that data transfer, I got 89.6 megabits per second. How efficient was that data transfer? It's 89.6 percent. Because the data rate was, the maximum was 100, but I only got 89.6, 89.6%. So we can say that that data transfer was 89.6% efficient in the way that it used the link. So here's my data rate. Think of this as the maximum speed at which we can send bits across the link or across a network. What is this number? Well, we call that the throughput. The data rate is the, or the number of bits we can send across a link. The throughput is a measure of the rate at which the real data, for example the user data, is successfully delivered to the destination. Because if we have overheads, like packet headers, that doesn't count towards the throughput. So we'd say this 89.6 is throughput. eleven point two megabytes per second or eighty nine point six megabits per second. Both are performance metrics and both are uh, considered when we're designing and building and selecting technologies for computer networks. So coming back, data rate is the maximum speed at which we can send bits across a link, across a network, but Actually, when we send data across that link, there may be some overheads, like packet headers. So throughput is a measure of the speed at which we can del deliver the real data across that link. So ignore uh, if we don't count all the overhead, then we get the throughput. And the throughput will be less than the data rate, less than or equal, in most cases, less. From the user's perspective, I downloaded the file. 89.6 megabits per second is the most accurate performance metric. It's the speed at which I receive the data. So that's important, the throughput. Download another file. Uh, let's see if we get the same. We may. Yeah, we got the same. Now let's create a smaller file. I just downloaded a 10 megabyte file and we got 11.2 megabytes per second, the same as before. Let's download a smaller file and see if we can get a, a different value. I need to create one. Mm, that one's not a very good example. It's too small. Okay, let's ignore that. Sorry. My example is not good for that one. My point I was trying to make is that sometimes the throughput will vary. That is, depending upon the protocols we're using, sometimes depending upon the, the size of the file, the data that we're downloading, this number can go up and down, the throughput, even when the data rate is fixed. So our data rate's our maximum, our throughput is what we actually achieve. 
and it may vary in different conditions. I can't create conditions to change it at the moment. Both, both performance metrics are used to measure uh, different technologies. Data rate, the maximum speed, throughput, the actual speed. The problem with throughput, even though it's more accurate, is that it's hard to measure in some cases. It's hard to predict. It may vary, so we don't know what it will be in advance. Data rate, normally we know based upon the technology. My wired LAN, 100 megabits per second. What about Wi-Fi? Let's switch back to Wi-Fi. On my laptop here. Enable the Wi-Fi. Now my laptop's connected to the SIT wireless LAN through that access point. What do you think the data rate is? Yep. Okay, let's see. I can actually see uh, the data rate. IW config shows me some details about my wireless LAN. And my wireless LAN, bit rate it's called here, data rate, 24 megabits per second. Let's try again, 48 megabits per second. It's now 48 megabits per second. So think of the data rate from my laptop to the wireless LAN access point on the wall is now 48 megabits per second. Before it was 24. In wireless LAN, in fact, it changes. It depends upon what I'm doing on it, and it also depends upon the, the signal quality, how strong the signal is. It will go up to 54 megabits per second in this case. And in this stage, it's reached the maximum. So the maximum data rate for my laptop to this access point is 54 megabits per second, but in fact there are lower ones. Let's download a file. long URL, I've got some files, uh, I have to find a file to download, just bear with me. One of the lecture notes from one of our future lectures, I'll get that, not found. Two things wrong. Downloading a file. So I, I provided a URL for a file on the ICT server. Uh, this long one was just a PDF file on the ICT server. And this program downloaded it. The file was about three megabytes in size. Throughput, two megabits per second. So what do we have? We had a data rate of 54 megabits per second. My wireless LAN. When I downloaded that file, I received a throughput 
of 2 megabytes per second, which is 16 megabits per second. And efficiency maximum speed or the data rate 54 megabits per second. I achieve 16 megabits per second, so efficiency is this 16 divided by 54, which is what uh, around 30 percent, a bit less compared to my wired LAN. Data rate was 100 megabits per second, throughput about 90 megabits per second, and same with the efficiency, 90% or 89.6%. Wireless LAN, lower data rate, but more importantly, lower efficiency. Because wireless LAN has more overheads incurred than my wired LAN. So both the data rate is lower, but also the efficiency is much lower, about a third of what we achieve with wired LAN. So, the, the data rate is normally part of the technology. It's specified as part of the standard. The throughput may vary depending upon the situation and will be less than the data rate. And the efficiency from our perspective is what percentage of the data rate do we use? So simply in this case, throughput divided by data rate expressed as a percentage. If I connected my two laptops using Bluetooth and tried to transfer a file, I'd have a different data rate, maybe one megabit per second, and get a different throughput and a different efficiency, most likely. So depending upon the technology, we have different rates and different throughputs. And the efficiency and throughput, why is it less than data rate? One of the main reasons is because of the overheads of the packet headers but there are other reasons as well when we look at individual protocols. Some questions. So we're starting to go look at some performance aspects of networks, so everyone's taking notes on how to do the calculations. When the quiz comes up, they'll be able to calculate these. For example, if I give you this picture, or some information like this, you'll be able to calculate the efficiency if you know the user data and the total packet size. Or if I give you in a question, the data rate is 100 megabits per second. We measured the efficient efficiency to be 89.6 megabit, 89.6 percent. What is the throughput? Well, 89.6 megabits per second. So some simple calculations there. Okay. Any problem? How about bandwidth? There's a question. What's, what's the impact of bandwidth? There's a question. We'll, I will not try and explain it here. We, in fact, need an entire topic to, to explain the relationship between bandwidth and these other factors. But I'll give the hint that uh, the, effectively, the larger the bandwidth, the larger the data rate we can achieve. Okay, we'll see the relationship more precisely, but the bandwidth that we have available impacts upon the data rate. Other things do as well. So why is my data rate 100 megabits per second? Why not 500 megabits per second? Why not 10 gigabits per second? 
Well, it depends on different factors, including the bandwidth, but other things as well. So bandwidth will impact upon data rate. And throughput depends upon the overheads caused by the different protocols used. In all of my examples, I used HTTP. If I used a different protocol, there may be different overheads, and we'll get a different throughput and efficiency. Generally, we want the highest possible. Choose a technology that gives a, a high data rate and a high throughput, at least high enough for the needs of your users. That's why we're interested in these metrics. Uh, one more calculation. Recall when we looked at our web page, that single packet, we saw that we had 600 bytes of the total size of the packet and the user data is 105 bytes. And we did a calculation and found that the efficiency in that case was about 17%. That is, 17% of the size is the real data. So in that case we had an efficiency of about 17%. So if I delivered that web page, because it was a web page of 105 bytes, if I delivered it across my wired LAN, what throughput would I get? I downloaded that web page across my wired LAN, my LAN cable. What throughput? 17% of the data rate. Okay. If my data rate was 100 megabits per second, and we say the efficiency, and we calculated this 17% from the, the packet size. 105 bytes of user data is about 17% of 599 bytes. 105 divided by 599 gives us, if we're 17% efficient, about 17 megabits per second throughput in that case. Much lower than uh, we saw with our real data transfer. There are two more metrics that are commonly used. We'll, talk, we'll spend some time on one of them, delay. The other one's packet delay variation. So data rate, the, the maximum speed at which we can send bits. Throughput, the actual speed at which our data is delivered, considering all the overheads. Right, that, so those both are about speed. Delay is about time, how long something takes. In your game, the ping time is a measure of delay the time it takes to get one message or a message from one point to another. So that's another important metric, the delay. Another one which we will not cover, uh, at least at this stage, is the, 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 the variation of delay between packets. But I've listed it here, but we'll not cover this one. We'll cover delay. But we'll cover delay next, next week. Okay? We need some time to go through some examples. So to finish for today, what we've done, if we skip back some slides, again, we're almost at the end of this lecture on protocol architectures. Protocols often introduce extra headers. When we send our data, the protocol adds some extra information to support its operation depends upon the actual protocol, how big it is. So in my computer I take some data, one protocol attaches a header, sends it to the next protocol to go to work, it may attach some header, sometimes it may attach a trailer, and then out of my computer what is sent? Some signal that represents all of that information, that entire message, the entire packet. 
those headers have some impact upon performance. We can draw the entire message like this. We label the headers depending upon the protocol being used. We can look at the size of them and calculate some efficiency in the data transfer. And now we're starting to go through, well, how do we measure performance? Different ways. Bandwidth is one we haven't touched upon. But two, we've introduced data rate and throughput. Data rate, the maximum speed we can send bits through a communications link or a network. Throughput, the actual speed at which we deliver data successfully across that link or network. And next week we'll continue with delay and that finishes this topic and we'll move on to how to transmit signals through a, a link. I'm going to stop there because we need more time for delay and if you have questions, come and see me. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you next, next Monday.